Okay, so this is a slightly different tool video. Um, and I'm starting off with a vacuum cleaner, which I uh, pretty obsessively cut away um, into sections, as you can see here. And it's funny, actually, because at Dyson, they, um, they basically have these on stand. Uh, and they used to be made from uh, a guy who I'll just name as Paul, um, who was basically incredible at making these. And um, I asked him, well, you know, how do you go about cutting one of these in half? You know, and he said, well, a lot of it is down to basically making sure you disassemble everything, reassemble it so that you understand where everything goes. But the other side of it is making sure that you mask and tape everything together so that when you put things through the saw, and I might add, you do all these parts individually, you don't push it through, otherwise everything jumps into the saw blade and ends up in a big dangerous mess. So you take each of these pieces and cut them and then mark, usually using a permanent marker like this, um, and then wiping the mark off with alcohol um, or acetone afterwards, and then reassembling it really carefully. But why I wanted to sort of put this in a context of tools was that I essentially got one of these as it was one of the first uh, serious projects that I worked on. I was involved in this filtration um, and motor uh, housing design and so that was called aeroacoustics because it was about monitoring how the sound performed as air was being you know powered around the machine at really really high speed and so this was at the time one of the, the, the quietest um, relative to its performance uh, machines that Dyson had ever done so I was really really proud of that um, and, and basically learned a huge amount from one of the principals called Dave um, who at the time I think it felt like he was really, uh, as they say, breaking my balls about getting things right. He was a real stickler, but I really think he took me to the next level. So therein is a little bit of, uh, should we say, hindsight. Um, and so I've always been incredibly grateful to, to him and, of course, the aeroacoustics team that we did all the testing. But anyway, tools. The reason you can do such a detailed disassembly of something like this and it still look reasonably crisp, the whole secret comes down to wet and dry paper. Um, all of this looks really, really rough and terrible when you put it through the bandsaw, but it comes up with this pretty crisp sheen all the way around. Um, with a few exceptions of sort of scalpel blades and things like this, all of it comes down to basically knowing how to use wet and dry paper. So I'll leave that there just for the section. But this was like the best bit of advice I've ever been given, uh, which is take a piece of MDF. The reason it's MDF is because there is no grain, there are no wobbles or defects. Um, and it's also nice and weighty. And you basically put photo mount, like spray mount. Do, do, do. Got some in the cupboard. So you can use stuff like this or photo mount or even just impact adhesive, like this sort of stuff. And you basically spray that both sides of the paper. And as you can see, there's a little number here of 1,200 and on the other side, 400. And then I've got another one which has a sort of coarser combination, probably something like uh, 800 and then another. And there's no sort of uh, fixed reason you want that particular combination, but I found often the aggressive 400 grit was taking off the worst of all the sort of saw marks. And then I was finishing off with 1,200 to get these nice, smooth, smooth finishes. So the other thing as well is, um, you may have noticed, and again, this is just sticking onto a bit of uh, Perspex, with these are just lathe offcuts um, at the time. <laughs> Literally, these are the ones I used uh, many years ago while I was at Dyson. Um, and yeah, I should, I should make a point I, I paid for this, so I didn't nick it, just in case anyone was worried uh, in the Dyson PR team. Um, but the, the key thing is that essentially you've got the sandpaper folded round here, which means you can get into those 90 degree corners. And then there's some times where you actually want to just keep sanding one face and not sand the corner, otherwise you get like a little indent. And so here it's just got electrician's tape. Um, to keep it smooth and that stops it from sort of chewing up um, any details and so again you can see I've written 600 here I've got 120 uh, all sorts of different different grits but these have basically been a mainstay for me on doing any sort of detailed 
uh, work, and of course, most recently, even with um, Sir David Jason behind the scenes on that. So I'd say a really good investment are these sort of chocolate box of all the different uh, varieties you get. It's it's kind of a bit of a, you, you get a bit of everything all the way up to 3,000, and I think the lowest is about 60. Um, so this really does cover everything. So in case you're wondering why is it wet and dry and not normal sandpaper, well, obviously you can use it dry um, and it will behave like normal sandpaper, but if you add water, it basically uh, stops all of that sort of fine powder going into the air. So even though I'd recommend just as a matter of course, it's a good idea to have a mask on in the workshop, um, but actually the, the adding the water to it means that it's much less likely to be inhaled. Though of course pay attention when it's dried and you come back the next day, that sort of like clump will end up being still quite volatile, so you want to be careful of that. So, the slight deviation I have from my usual here is a tool like this soldering iron or whatever, um, is that I wanted to show, you know, a little bit how to make tools, as I think it's sort of almost the next evolution of, uh, should we say, finding good tools or finding good enough tools, as I think I'm quite a keen supporter of. Um, but you can see these are basically tongue depressors, and I've just applied super glue um, to it and then stuck down some of those sheets. Now, I admit, I haven't written on them because since, you know, being a graduate engineer, I tend to be able to feel the grit with my fingers and be pretty confident of what it is. But as a rough guide, this will be probably something like 1200, 800, uh, 600, and maybe a sort of 400 or 300. And so it allows me to sort of essentially work through a piece all the way up to quite a high finish. And in case you were new to sort of the grit scale, um, <clears throat> it's basically the density of the number of pieces of grit you can get per whatever it is, square. It's probably something weird and imperial like square inch or whatever, or a weird thing that I, I'm unfamiliar with. But essentially a big number is super fine. So like... 3,000 is, is almost getting something to a polish, like uh, just, just before glass. Um, and so this is, per 1,200 is perfectly good for glass. Um, and again, I think, as you can see, some of these have been cut into different shapes. And I think, again, that's why these sort of lollipop sticks and tongue depressors are great, is that sometimes you're really having to work into a little detail and sort of finesse something. And so I think these are incredibly cheap, but honestly take your game to a next level. Um, and it's not bragging for the sake of bragging, it's just saying that, you know, I remember going to Paul repeatedly going, is this good enough? What do you think? What do you think? And there was a time when he's like, that's just good enough, man. It's good. And so I, I would like to think that this is on parity with the standard which Dyson puts out. Um, don't sue me if it isn't. But essentially, the, the, I can honestly say that the trick of the trade is really making your own tools and using wet and dry in an intelligent way. Um, and I think as well, if you're unfamiliar with using bandsaws, definitely watch a YouTube video. Um, there is definitely a right and a wrong way to approach a bandsaw. You don't want things to jump and slip as you're cutting them. But I think this is a really interesting exercise for um, not just physically cutting through everything in a sequential manner, but one of the things Paul really impressed on me is what things do you want to make an exception to the rule because it adds visual interest. So you can see these bearings are, aren't just following the clean line and this little spring is just a bit of humour which I think uh, both Paul and me really loved. And you can see here, <coughs> excuse me, just the, the impeller blades have been left just hovering in mid-air, just left on with the tiniest amount of metal. And I was actually really proud of the fact that I figured out how to put epoxy to glue these uh, motor windings together and then sand them back, and then I actually put lacquer on them so that they retain their, their shiny colour. Um, the same with this, this is lacquered, because otherwise it just goes to a dull uh, sort of, and, and indeed can go slightly oxidised, sort of to a verdigris colour. So I think this is just one of those nice projects. If you have a broken appliance, um, I think working through things with either a bandsaw, if you have one, or even just you know, standard hacksaws and carefully cutting through the sections, I think really gives you a sort of uh, appreciation for how things go together um, and a little bit of how to sort of communicate, uh, you know, what you want to say with that particular piece. So there we go. And again, you can see I just even got these kicking around from a recent project. 
um, which is a sort of very funky black MDF. So there we go. Hope that's useful. Um, thanks again. Bye.